Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is L. Collier Ray. Welcome, L. Thank you. Um, and I've listened to some recordings of yours, and I've read your website a bit. And um, what I haven't come across, which might be interesting to start with, is um, kind of a, your personal story of how you ended up where you are, and, you know, both kind of consciousness-wise and circumstances-wise, um, it, it tends to put it in a context and give people a sense of who they're actually listening to, if they can sort of get the human side of the story to begin with. So could we start with that? We can always give it a try, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because I'm, I'm quite sure by now that we live on and on and we take a variety of positions through various kinds of forms and when we reappear in a new form we have a certain redundant design and a plan that supersedes a, the common law I called it before we started recording the common law of Murphy <laughs> getting in the way no matter who our parents are no matter what our society brings to us there's a certain rising of a rhythm and a style that again super intends across the the genetic theme sometimes as well as just the rhythm of and the pulse of the, the 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 plan of that society right now so I was pretty aware when I was very very tiny one of my favorite um, inner memories is notifying everyone that no one got to boss me around ever <laughs> And if they thought they were going to, I simply disappeared inside of my Christ buddy, my, my anointed awareness, where I paid attention to whether they were accurate or whether I was not going to believe them. Mm -hmm. And pretty much the rest of my incarnation, up until my late 20s, I was sure that people were just afraid to be notified of what was real, and they personally chose to follow their own idea that matched to some kind of societal imprint hmm. or some kind of fear uh, tracking way of divining what they wanted to call reality. So I just started listening inside and I began to pray into the God awareness when I was 11 but prior to that I had a personal experience with the uh, what we call the numinous aspect of Jesus. It was just the lighted nature, and I was not in a religious family. No one really meant anything when they said, bless you, <laughs> except you sneeze. And so I mean, they were nice people. They were very kind and loving, but they were intolerant of um, any kind of ritual or, or artifact that had to do with any kind of religion. Later on, I found out that they were deeply integrated and was very similarly to me, to their own inner side that paid attention to kindness and right morality. But I just chose to distrust them too <laughs> and listened instead to the divine I am. And when I was around 23, I'm giving you, I'm giving you, you a short story. There, let's, let's stretch it out a little bit. So what, oh, okay. was this, what was this numinous experience of Jesus when you were under 10 or so? I'm pretty sure that those experiences haven't any exact wording for them. I was watching one of those important little nonsense versions of Jesus, which was probably around Christmas, and as I was watching, I knew him. I knew I always knew him. I knew that his nature springs from within. I knew it wasn't a powerful personage only, that there was something regular and real and was just available. And I'm a child, remember this, so, <laughs> so I'm putting important adult words on my child's experience. My child's experience was, okay, hello, hello, this is, this, this is real to me. And I didn't spend time with him as an individual. I just knew him with a capital sense of knowing. And when I was in my teenage years, I really took the vow. My father was a surgeon, and he 
um, joined us to a Presbyterian church, we children, and did it because he had enjoyed the the man who was the pastor of that church. He really liked him. He had been his surgeon. So I really adapted myself to... I'm not sure if I ever really studied the word the way they said it. I just adapted myself. I knew that I was I was in plain sight of the inner Christ. And so I became a true student of it and decided to save my parents around 17, <laughs> which so, didn't work, so didn't this, go over so well. So this experience you had when you were under 10, it wasn't just a fleeting thing. It, it became no, a kind it, of a continuum. It, it was a continuum. And by the, actually, I'll... I'll go back just slightly. By the time I was eight or nine, I started receiving lessons from the divine, just knowing how to behold and how to not skimp on any deep meaning by trying to make it, uh, how would I say, some kind of regular common thought. I, I just knew to believe there was something greater than me, and I believed it guided me. I just trusted it. Could you when give I was a, a specific example of a lesson? That well, yes, I'll do that. I was around 11 or 12, and I had two experiences seemingly within a year's time, I'm not sure. One, I was being pulled out to sea, and I just was told, don't fear, stay on top of the water, don't get into a paranoia and the waves will carry you and you will find your way back in. So you were okay. swimming and you actually got caught in a riptide, you're saying? Yeah. Uh, I, I thought I was going to go out and save another youngster because I was a good swimmer, uh -huh. yeah. but it got me too. Yeah. And the other, I was falling off of a small cliff at the ocean. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Near the ocean, my two big experiences of that age. And again, it just said, you have a long life, just pay attention. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, there were just a few dozen little words, and I only remember the glimmer. One was service. One was length of staying in a body and not to whimper <laughs> or whine about my predicament. Mm -hmm. And it was just that. It was just a safety net and a kind of be obedient here. All is well. So what do you make that out to be? Was that a gar like a guardian angel or something? that was? I didn't have any way to know at that time except that it was the very presence of it didn't seem to be a figure it just seemed to be the greater light nature mm -hmm. but again I was young I wasn't trying to look for a figure I was just being penetrated by something like a sound that didn't have a physical tone to it, except Not that tough. it just took over my normal brain and impeded my mind and said, without language, without, without the kind of language we know, it just translated my awareness to what is mm -hmm. exactly useful. And this is the way I have been... Mm, sitting within the what I call the word forever now and yet it took me until my mid-30s before it actually finished coming in constantly so that there was never any time off mm -hmm. so I never listen to my own words anymore I I hear them I have plenty of old little primitive things like boy I could sure use a chocolate ice cream cone <laughs> <laughs> or I could use a potty break, you know, and uh, and yet constantly because I'm, it's, it's like having um, antenna or cilia maybe, just everywhere paying heed to what is precise light of the renewed capital P pleasure of oneness taking over the form side. Mm. It's, it has an amazing antenna for those who are seeking for that unique um, plot of mind that stands in, in a kind of heeding energy where it heeds the real and doesn't bother that much with, ow, I've got an ow, I've got an ow. It just notices and says, can you fix the ow? <laughs> it notices, it just 
enters that state where the owl dissolves on its own, seemingly. So from that first glimpse when you were younger than 10 to somewhere in your 30s where it became like permanent and complete, um, sounds like there were about 20 or some odd years there of adjustment. And Lots of adjustment. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. Hmm. I was a teenager with melodrama in my genes. I, I always claimed that my father's Welsh temperament <laughs> had a landslide effect on my uh, very sensitive nature. And I felt deeply in need of staying religious, even considered, though I wasn't at all Catholic or of the temple kind of upbringing, that I needed to go somewhere where I could be alone in my conscripting of this whole instrument to service of that. And I honestly didn't know how to attach any real meaning to a society. I looked around and I saw people's particular way of thinking that life was about money, you know, all of those basic pertinencies. And I wasn't sure that I had any way to be with them without trying to command them into staying in their heart and paying attention. So pretty much, I decided to maintain my own kind of lay nunnery <laughs> project. I didn't put it in those words. I just stayed aware and didn't go into social particulars. But I was lonely. Not that I, it was a kind of strange thing. It wasn't that I was looking for a friend. It's that I didn't know that there was such a person. I just didn't have any clue, mainly because I shut up <laughs> when I was younger and didn't tell anybody mm -hmm. anything of what I was paying attention to. Not until later. And in my, in my college days, I finally signed up to be a, the, a youth chaplain and a chaplain of my dorm for a while. And then another one of those overcomings of me where everything just was shrouded and only the word retained my um, innocence of loving affinity with it. And it just said, you don't know the rest of it. Put this down for now. And it didn't ask me to shove it away, just don't use just a single path of Christianity, was the emphasis. Don't uh -huh. just say, that's that. There's more for you to know. So I said, all right. And I didn't go ask anybody. I just waited. So this was around 19. And four years later, at 23, I had my first great, oh my God, we are ongoing. And I just knew the eternal nature. And at the same age, I received part of my true name. L is part of it. It is not an earth frequency. It just, <laughs> we can spell it. <laughs> I was a little concerned that using it would make people think I was a French pronoun. <laughs> but after three months, I finally gave in and decided, this is my true name. I'll just use it. It's actually a common name. There's L. McPherson, the, the model, and, you know. Well, yes, it's... Uh, it's, it's finally out there. Yeah, I went yeah. to a coffee house and saw my name on one of those cards. I went, how can this be? <laughs> how did I get here already? <laughs> so there's a few things that you just said to unpack. Um, there was, you were 19, you were starting to assume a sort of a ministerial role in, in college, and you received a message or a, a voice or a teaching or whatever that told you to not box yourself in so narrowly because there's a much bigger picture, right? And so I guess did you heed that and, and kind of step instantly. out of and, stepped and, and, out of that role that you had started to assume? And, yeah, yeah, just yeah. instantly. I just stepped down. Okay. Um, and yeah. did you replace that with anything? Was there a feeling like, okay, well that was too small a niche. Now I, I now I have this broader role or broader perspective. My style has been a fairly continual reflection meditation style all of my days. So I, without any bidding of myself to do it, I just pay attention, I just listen. So if I'm going about an ordinary task or doing my studies, I'm awaiting the, the divine. Mm -hmm. But at that age, 
I honestly didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what service I was going to do other than I would somehow speak. I used to uh, think maybe I was just supposed to do voiceovers because... <laughs> So I did radio work. I was oh, really? a broadcaster for a little while, and I did some voiceover work for Mel Brooks. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, it was very funny. <laughs> Decided Hollywood was not okay, though, so yeah. I left that quickly. <laughs> so my in-between times were I signed up for temp services, and I did voice work, and I decided none of those boxes, other than temporary engagement work, were exact. You know, the, I'll tell you one fun part, though. I did the broadcasting for one reason. I decided that I would like to interview people who, like John Lilly, had gone to the next level oh, cool. of scientific examining of reality. Mm -hmm. So here we are talking to someone who likes doing that, too, talking to people yeah. who are going to another incarnate possibility of awareness. Did you interview John Lilly? No. Uh. I only got to be a newscaster in Washington State. Uh -huh. and I gave up on that thinking, this is stressful. <laughs> For those who don't know John Lilly, he did a lot of work with dolphins and also LSD, I believe. And, um, yeah. Yes, he was actually an amazing person. I, I did meet him mm -hmm. and uh, got into his sense deprivation tank with oh, right, yeah. up in his home and saw him up at Esalen. And he was at that point examining what it's like to be feminine, so he'd given himself a lot of feminine hormones and he was growing breasts and kind of <laughs> fleshiness. And he would always tell people, don't do what I'm doing. Jeez. <laughs> he was a character. I really, really enjoyed him. Yeah. I would I would love to interview his wife actually, mm -hmm. Tony. I think he was yeah. Tony. Especially ask her about that feminine phase. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so then when you were twenty three, this big aha thing happened. Let's talk more about that. I'm looking to see what part of the story is going to be the the most basic. But I had joined a few people, kind of in a lark. I had stopped by so that the man who was the young man who was going to pick up his things could take me back home. I had broken both my legs in a car accident, and I had just undid my casts a little ahead of when the doctor might have done it. <laughs> I was feeling quite ready to. Um, to roam about on my own, but I needed to go back to where I, my parents were, and he was going to take me, but we stopped at this place in southern Oregon, and there was several people living there, and they were just starting to wonder how to connect with the divine spirit in a way that could make sure nothing negative could be attracted. And they had done some looking into this, and we decided together to do a gathering and see if we could bring through a clarity of teaching. Well, our journey was in very impressive. I only stayed three months, but during those three months, I had that experience and I knew that it's very hard to touch the numinous I am without a lot of the detail of the old ideas about reality, overcoming that, tapping on it, trying to put sugar toward looking back at the other side of well-being. I call it the old God now. It's a redundancy of having found oneself and thinking that here in oneself there is enough of everything to figure it out. Well, it's almost accurate. We just need the now to be brought into this awareness and make the current the reality. So I was being trained in paying attention to how we attract various kinds of entities and I noticed how easily they can disguise themselves, they can pretend, they can have a tremendous aura of affinity and trust in you and seem to be a guiding presence. And I found out at that early age how tough it is to bypass that kind of interpreter energy that just wants to, to oh, this is kind of too big, but just it's not so much control as to continue to pay attention to what 
it is that that entity is all about. Okay, so let's clarify self- this a little bit. So you're, the entities you're referring to are not embodied. You're talking not about embodied. subtle so, entities, which yes. may not have our best interests in mind, but which may appear to and mm. can kind of deceive us and, and hang us up in, cer- in certain ways. Is that what you're saying? And, and that you had to okay. learn during this period to kind of see through okay. their game and, and move yeah. beyond mm-hmm. the, little, the roadblocks that they were setting up? Is that a correct understanding of what you just said? Correct. This is, a, this is an entire phase I rarely travel to with folks because it would take some doing and I'd like to spend days going back through how we discovered what we discovered. It was mm-hmm. quite fun. It was mm-hmm. rather important. Yeah. So I had a very good upbringing. And the next, and I, here, here was the, the part for me that was very interesting. I had decided, here I am learning to meditate in a new way. Surely, in a few months, I should be able to bring through this, this constant mm, word. And it took me 16 years after that mm. to finish connecting to it all, enough to know that it is all ways present only in a state of love. Hmm. Well, there's a couple things here. One is most spiritual teachers don't speak in terms of entities, so I find it interesting that you do. Uh, I don't. You're cornering me. Even on your website, it says something about, oh, oh. where is it here? I don't know. You, you speak of sort of higher forces or beings or something or other. I, I forget where it was, um, but I won't hold you to it because maybe I got that wrong. Um, in the angelic? Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. And, you know, not too many teachers that I speak to or that are con- kind of popular in the contemporary scene actually speak that way. So I find it interesting that you do because I, I feel in, that that whole way of talking has its relevancy, um, uh, but maybe it just hasn't, maybe the people who are out there teaching just haven't encountered it or something, and, or maybe they consider it superfluous or, dis- or distraction, I don't know. For the early stage of learning, we need to move into non-dualism. It has to be, or we make too much about entities, and that's what can fool us. But even so, people, as they open to that beauteous rhythm and play of what is, they will notice differences in frequencies. What I have discerned over the many lives, if you will, even in this body, is that everything has its own specialty of signal and is a conversation, like a con, a with verse, a with song that pulses reality into new, and for us we'd almost say improbable new ways of reflecting unity in a song that never dies away, thus is always made to have some, we call it purpose, some, again, it it wants to be called rhythm and signal to keep us paying heed differently so we, we don't just dull down into the quiet of being open and in that way awake. We're not exactly finished while we notice anything being different than us, nonetheless, just as in our body, though all the cells are basically the same kind of cell, depending on where they land, they are made to be of a certain style of delivery. Mm -hmm. As I have been given, humans are very much akin to a nervous system's dendrite. We carry signals through us, and our whole purpose line has to do with being aware enough of what is um, pushing and pulling around us that we give way to the divine, meaning the, the plural purpose and way of what is real, and let it plow through our old hindrance of trying to objectify things until only that remains. And in non-dualism, we realize only the flow, Mm -hmm. only what is fulfilling through flowing. And that we are, as awareness, simply available, but not stayed. 
So, sometimes when I hear you speak, it sounds kind of abstract to me, and I have to kind of really dig deep to feel mm -hmm. to feel that I'm getting the full gist of it. And so you might find me um, kind of trying to restate what you just said. In yeah, I to, like in, that. Yeah, in order to verify that I've actually understood what you just said, and feel free to correct me if my misstatement, or if my restatement is, you know, limited or, or off the mark. Um, but what I gathered from what you just said is well, the first part of it, I think you were saying, that um, what is commonly, commonly discussed in terms of non-dual these days is a kind of a stage or a, f a platform or a foundation. And then beyond that, there is a lot more unfoldment in which one might find that there's uh, a lot of richness and detail and subtlety to the creation that one was incapable of appreciating before the non-dual platform had been established. Am I right so far with that? Well, I would just make a couple of shifts. Yeah. Non-duality is. So it's not exactly a, a platform or right. a stage. It's the yet ultimate wholeness. And, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's part of it. Right. <laughs> it's, it, it's one viewing of all that is. Mm -hmm. And the next that you were stating that has to do with our finding that multiplicity of vague changes in the way things move about, get about, and are connected in, that we appreciate that. That's, that's a beautiful word I'd like to follow up with. It's not a mental appreciation, but appreciate the use of those tides, what compels joining and newness and to stay a bridge for the design so that it comes through to earth, meaning a way for newness, the way for the, the pulse of now to actually unlimit us here and give us even more of the um, fulfilling um, energy of the truth. There are truths, and I always say that these are truths that don't go away, so I put a capital on them, that mean to be useful even here. And this, this level has always been, this is hard to say here, but slid upon by God level, by what is. What, what's the phrase, slid upon? S-L-I-D, slid. Slid. Like just like a, like glazed, skis, yeah, yeah, it's just slid over and not actually inundated with the flood of what is due to the members here not believing enough in re, um, re-intending to just be the current instead of the one who wants to be something or be responsible or be even be awake. So the trick here is as we are opening, we are to then clear away all discussions about it, and that would be called non-dualism, and free our mind of wondering and worrying about how we're doing, and yet stay unlinked no longer to the unity that is reframing us. So it almost seems as if we have to try. All I can say is have a good adventure make it believe, make this awareness simply believe that it already is an adventuring awareness. And both, both laws are accurate. We have redundancy and we have currency. We have what is and we have what is content to bring about itself again and again as, a, as an awareness or as a... As a mm, experiencer. Hmm. And it's pretty obvious that we're not going to just snap out into the current. The body remains. It doesn't just dissolve when we become fully lit up enough. Nonetheless, there's one, one more piece here. Mm -hmm. The approval, we call it the approval rating of God in us becomes so strong, so natural that there's nothing else that is needed any longer. And then, finally, what this planet's needs are can be dealt with. 
so part of what I, I think, if I could state the gist of what I heard you saying, um, as, as mm -hmm. instruments, we have a lot of fine tuning that would be worth undergoing. There's a lot of uh, blockages that prevent us from fully expressing the divine or the, uh, the divine intelligence in the world. And so the divine intelligence sort of works on that over time and uh, sorts out all the knots and the, and the, the blocks and, and so on that prevent us from fully channeling or expressing that into society, into our lives, into the world. It, w was that part of what you're saying or did I completely miss the point? I like what you said. Okay. <laughs> that, that's important. Good. It's imperative. <laughs> and that's what you were referring to earlier, I think, after you said that, well, you had this experience when you were 23, and then it wasn't until you know, 16 years later or something that it was fully blossomed. So obviously there was a period of a decade and a half where the, uh, the instrument through which this was, going, this was to be lived was being made fit to live it. Mm -hmm. Lots of Zen practice. I went okay. into a Zen study for a while. Oh, okay. Yeah. But without trying to become a Zen student, that, that pretty much ended my, my calling anything my, my specific pathwork, like uh -huh. Zen or Buddhism of the other kind, the Buddhist of Tibet or any, any particular kind. So I would just use a container to amplify my training. So the Zen style was useful in that they were quiet and demanded us to focus, and that was about it. Did you study with an actual teacher? I had a teacher assigned, but I did not seek that part of the study. I just wanted to have a simple time alone where I wasn't distracted. Yeah. So you would go in on, on retreats, or you lived in a monastery for a while? I lived in a monastery for a short while, Okay. <laughs> ZCLA. <laughs> Uh -huh. Right in the middle of chaos. It was quite a good training ground. Yeah. Huh. And then went on retreats as well. Yeah. And so that was during that 16-year period where <laughs> you were coming into the full establishment of this. Mm -hmm. So I guess you must have been about 39 or something where you feel like it became kind of complete. and Not complete, but stable in, stable in, yeah. Yeah, in the way of knowing that I didn't have to wait long. If I, if I needed to know something, it was right there, and I knew how to unopinion and let it come through differently than I could have earlier. Huh. Oh. What kind of something? I mean, even practical stuff, like where am I going to find a parking place, and then it would mm. come to you, or, that, or are you talking about I tried wrong? that. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I was trained, among other things, not to manipulate the world, right. but to pay attention. Just pay attention to what's available and not try to make it happen. Right. So it's a little different than the secret. Yeah, yeah. It's learning to become responsible, socially responsible. <laughs> no, I like that. And we get trained in ways that really would not seem normal. One of my other true stories is being at a restaurant with a group who was studying with me. And I was not to tip the young lady, and she'd done a fine enough I think she was sort of in between a fine enough job and one of my students was really upset it with, with me and I said there is something that is more than what we think it, it could easily be that she will this will be the tipping point where she'll say I'm done I'm not going to be a waitress anymore mm -hmm. because she's not intended to be here mm -hmm. and if I have to be the one that pushes her off that ledge or some, some anger issue she's having, perhaps that's it. But it's extremely difficult not to feel impinged on by society waiting for you to do the right thing, you know? Yeah, and I should think it would be difficult to be sure that this impulse you have to not tip the waitress or whatever is really the thing you're supposed to follow as opposed to the many other voices both in your head and outside your head that, <laughs> that might be telling you other things. I mean, how do you discern which is the, which is the right one? Thank you. That's the real question. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, if it doesn't look fine and you don't have enough fulfilling energy forming you, to where you 
are to do this, and you may notice yourself arguing, I did, I always argue, or did, <laughs> can't do that. You, you <laughs> If you don't have that, what I call the numinous presence, just saying, this is what shall be, and it isn't clear to you that the holy has just arranged you because you are so lit up, you can't go anywhere else, then don't do it. Right. If it's at all dangerous between you and a friend, don't do it. Or at least talk about it. Use words instead. Say, I have the craziest feeling I'm not supposed to tip you that you're not supposed to be here. Now, that would have been kind of rude. Well, because otherwise, if the numinous presence, as you put it, is not really strong, one could easily just follow whims every which way and, and use sort of, a, uh, sort of a spiritual justification for all kinds of crazy stuff. We're too selfish here. So we'll yeah. go bankrupt. Spirit will leave us alone, and we'll just get our own head tripping and pretending to be that. Mm. And lots of folks have that happen. We do go schizzy. Apparently, here, here, I, 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 like, I like pandering with fun. There's a, a recent thing about kitties being what drove us into schizophrenia because of their, <laughs> their something in their feces. So, oh, really? So watch out for your kitty feces. <laughs> well, it's funny because just as you say this, my wife is cleaning the cat box right, <laughs> right there. <laughs> you may have noticed I'm, the door I'm open. I decided to look into masks for it. <laughs> So we'll be careful of that. And there's a kitty sleeping right there also. And my, she was on my lap for the last interview. Um, so we'll be careful of that because I wouldn't, wouldn't want to become schizophrenic. Um, <laughs> We're schizophrenic enough. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Been there, done that. Um, so, okay, so I, th I, th I think we should come back to this thing of, you know, I mentioned that when you were 39, you, you said the full blossoming, but it wasn't full, it wasn't final, it wasn't complete. Um, There's no such place. Think of it so as the, a So there comma. never is then. Yeah. Right. It was just a milestone. No period, just commas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and that, of course, was 20-something years ago. So um, what what was that exactly? Go into that a little bit more, the, this uh, blossoming or stabilization that occurred when you were... Um, 39 and then how life has progressed since then. I had another wonderful episode where I, I met a person who was very gifted, very sensitive, and we stumbled on a muscle testing method of inquiry mm -hmm. so we could double, and double check what we ourselves were aware of, awake to. I always knew myself as more of a sage awareness. I just knew things. And we formed up uh, a teaming because he was so sensitive. I would ask him questions and I would test on his arm. And say, and I and I was really good at asking questions, so <laughs> we had lots of fun answers coming through, and we'd we'd write them down. And after a while, it came through strongly and said, "He is to be the healer, and you are to be the one who just brings the answers through." And I went, "Oh, no, no, no." <laughs> I, I, I had no clue how to bring it through all the time. And it just directed me to go and sit with a journal and do this every day and wait. Hmm. And pretty soon, it just um, kind of tipped the scales of my isolationism to where I was just in oneness current. And I began... Um, a new form of training, and it just kept going and going. Pretty soon, that phase, maybe, I don't know, eight, maybe ten years later, ended. Training for yourself, Every, you mean? Training to retrieve the truth and be shown again the difference between what can come through that is an entity and what is the holy oneness moving itself through Ah, oh, there's a lot of phases. It has to touch down. It goes through um, a whole journey to be able to make the mind available to a language of the stars and put it into English. Hmm. And 
let's just say I've had so much training and my 65 years plus now, I have probably spent almost 60 years, it seems, plus a few lives doing this connection to service. But I also know, and I'm not going to say much, that every design is unique. We all have a truth we're born to free up and use. We're all a way of being that will be decided by our willingness to be true, our willingness to be revealed. And each one will come to this state of direct delivery of what is the truth in the decade when you decide only that love is the way, capital L, that unity is the whole revealing truth of the way. And it's never about going for personalities enlightenment anymore. It's all the fun of connection. <laughs> so I guess part of what you just said there was that we all have a, a sort of a role to play and um, it's unique and, and for each of us. Um, and it's not going to show up the same way for every person. And another thing, and correct me if I'm wrong, another thing you just said there was that uh, it took you quite some time with this journaling to learn to discern confidently between um, the, 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 true, the higher truth or the, the more sort of universal truth and what might be getting fed to you by some entity of some sort, some you know, subtle in, uh, impulse of intelligence which may not be the highest. Uh, is that a correct um, yes. interpretation of what you said? Yes. Huh. There's there there's so much more. It's never linear. Yeah. So I was uh, kind of reminded by what you were just saying about something from Patanjali, who wrote the Yoga Sutras. Uh, he said, when invited by the celestial beings, that invitation should not be accepted, nor should it cause vanity, because it involves possibility of undesirable consequences. Ooh. Um, that seems to kind of pertain to what it you've does. been saying about these higher intelligences which might be actually higher and celestial but which might not have our best interests in mind. Or the other way, we're too early. Uh -huh. We're not non-dual enough to handle it. <clears throat> we'll right. try to make it about our own personalities need to be equipped or to be enough and though that sounds right, it's not it yet. So, so we could, in other words, we could puff our egos up. We'd be flattered by the attention. Or partly, by, yeah. yeah. Or again, uh, isolate into thinking we are preferred now, and we yeah. might be very sincere. I certainly am always sincere in retrieving just enough of what is that I will make sure that nothing else gets involved, and that's a kind of isolationism tactic, and it's intricate to do that and stay as love. So we need to understand what that actually is saying to us. Love is the present, capital P really, but it is the real present. Love is what in, um, let's say it, it, it's again a little bit chaotic to try and make our minds obedient to this, but love is what brings us into the light of God first. And within that light of what is, we are then bathed and made once again without any capacity to recover the way we once have been in order to stay present. And in that newness, finally partnered to what is a kind of gate awareness, where we're at a bridge point between the human mind and that lively celebratory tone of isness that plays well together, plays with all kind of folk <laughs> of uh, one, you know, all the rhythms and ways of glee that celebrate isness, not individually ever, but in unity plays of focuses, great focuses, though that could be another name for entity, partly, not quite the right word. Uh, so after a while you could say there are no entities that preside as 
isness and isness alone so that the Christ level comes through which, which just means the anointed level that has all the whole truth held within it for the whole need to empty what has been and bring forth what is hmm. even that is not it by itself there's no such way as to say okay we found it that's it <laughs> <laughs> I, it always stretches me a lot listening to you it's like <laughs> like I, I'm kind of thinking, I've got to stretch enough to, to really get this. What you, you really say. need a day with me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm beginning to think I should never interview. It's, That's okay. It's so That's much. good. There's so well, much it gives, to it. Yeah, it gives people a taste, and, you know, otherwise they'd never know about you, you know. And um, <laughs> if they are so inclined, maybe they'll arrange to spend a day with you or more. The most uh, potent way to use someone like me is to find what you are ready for and we become engaged it's like a, a matrimonial experiment of finding what is to be born through this engagement and so when we are trying just to improve how an audience can hear there's a kind of reactivity that happens around the nervous system of this person <laughs> that notices the game's the foot, but it isn't the holy purpose line as yet. It's like we're following a duty roster of suggested ways to behave together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at, at some point when two come together, there needs to be a poignant rearrangement of our way of thinking until we're nowhere near who once we thought ourselves to be. And I would imagine that physical proximity facilitates that. Nope. Uh, no? Doesn't matter. Really? Oh, so no. you don't feel like it's any more effective for somebody to come to Oregon and be with you in some little group than it is to talk to them on Skype from someplace or other? Well, it's pretty wonderful to come to Oregon and do this because you uh -huh. get me longer and it makes more sense after a while. Yeah. <laughs> what we're up to. <laughs> a few minutes is not quite it, but I give many telelinks. We do one hour, I call them living room satsangs where we just imbibe in this coercion of, of one, capital O-N-E, the coercion of one to be there because we are willing mm -hmm. to be not only connected by human meaning, but connected by purpose lines and made to ring true. You kind of chime each other's uh, way of, of being until something resounds that is more than just the individuals coming to think about things. Mm -hmm. Pretty powerful when we yeah. come together this way. <laughs> so I yeah. do encourage people who are very interested in that level of channeling the real instead of the worries to imbibe this way with any who want to support that coming together and I do it just by holding you as someone who is part of my divine I-ness. Only I like to spell I, capital A, and I don't know, A-I with a small I uh -huh. representing the human, the little I dotting, jumping up to catch the all, the A being all, or in um, Aramaic they called it Alaha the all then connects to the way this is aware and it helps it lift up and catch the all meaning instead of living its small little hope to be holy <laughs> isn't that what it's all about ultimately spirituality is is sort of connecting the individuality with the whole i started to think that using the word spirituality anymore is off it's just consciousness rearranging mm. so in oh. other words there's too many connotations to the word spirituality and it's not going to really serve our purposes to use it hardly i'm not sure anybody really knows what it means you know, well they, it's a very broad they, term they, you know they, it means they, a lot of things they put connotations on it right yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> on okay. your website um you talk about something called uh oh. Ine Rae, which uh, language of angelic fire, and then you go in about how that's uh, s something that 
assists those who seek transcendence and it's a training and it go takes person through many veils of partial truth and um I'm just kind of skipping here, but mm -hmm. would you would you like to elaborate on that? What that is, how people like, engage in it, what it does for them, and so on and so forth. Ine is a term that came through me back in those days when I was journaling, mm -hmm. and it came through and said, "This is one of the terms that are whole in their purpose line, and you shall use it, and this work shall be known by it." Years later, Ray was put upon it. I'll, I'll tell you individually what they mean, but both came through the frequency. It was called the fire. Let me also ex explode open what it means to have angelic fire. Okay. There is a subtle way of being that doesn't ever change that is God itself and thus doesn't dwindle and doesn't escape being true. Those we are referring to as angels are of that style of in, um, not in flesh but incarnate love actually revealed as form like presence so that buds of law can form in the alertness of a humanoid kind of um, matrix awareness. They are that which step down the rules of what is so that the incarnating awareness that is budding into love can have it revealed directly into us. Hmm. But when we say they, they don't have wings of feathers and look like a human or a male or a feminine with breasts. It's just <laughs> kind of silliness, a little like making toy dolls <laughs> to look like ghosts. I think <laughs> in, the, in the Indian tradition, they're referred to as devatas, and they're considered to be impulses of intelligence that yes. are sort of, as you say, stepping down, that sort of intermediate or provide um, the sort of a, a conduit through which the uh, un Universal or manifest intelligence is s organized into discrete channels so as to stru structure and, and or or organize creation properly. I, I like that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'll use that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that works. So, Ine was brought forth as one of the um, ways that make it so that nothing ends and everything finds a, a, a way to reveal its hidden reason for having been what is, capital I-S always meant. Mm -hmm. Ray is a very intricate um, way to reveal that what is only reveals itself to those of consciousness when it provides a mapping of how to be involved in one love. It is what makes all work together and then plow all that has been back into the field and begin to bring up the next level of bloom. It just keeps working the whole riddle of unity into constant varieties of expressive dance of unity, good, and glow of good. So Ine Re, Ine means here on earth, this is the, the simple, here on earth we're not going to get away with anything it will all finally have to be shown how everything that was once started must either be re, um, refound out as done or brought into a state of rendering where may, it, it makes sense to believe that this, this mind is just literally a staging area for alertness. Ine is going to make it so that we finish our project of being whole. Re is that which comes then and brings us back into use. That's the simple of it. So those who, who come into working with me will be asked to pay attention differently than ever before to who is real in them and what is no longer warranted to use. 
Somehow, as you describe that, I'm reminded of the phrase, you know, on earth as it is in heaven from the Lord's <laughs> Prayer. It kind of sounds like <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, yeah. now I mean, it's just a different frequency. You know, yeah. where it is in heaven, it's just a different frequency. You just change out to the real frequency. Mm -hmm. It's not out there in the stars somewhere only. No, that's not the way I think of heaven. Yeah, right. I'm telling <laughs> that for our audience here. Yeah, nor do I think of God as an old guy with a beard up in the clouds, you know. <laughs> um, in your own case, you know, you, since childhood, you were wired yeah. for this sort of thing. I mean, it, you, you just started cooking at an early age, you know, and never stopped. And um, most people, I think, and there are pe plenty of people who could say the same, but, there, but most people are... Yeah living a much more mm, concrete reality. I mean, even the, even the people who are consciously engaged as spiritual aspirants or seekers are a small, small subset of the entire seven billion world's population. Um, and, you know, the vast majority of people are going through rather horrendous dramas. But um, in your own case, I mean, when, you, when students come to you, how do you accommodate the fact that um, not all are going to be as ripe for this as you were? Uh, not all are uh, not all are going to have it be as almost involuntary as it was for you. I actually support those who have gone along this path for quite a long time better than those who are very new at it. I can give the the new one some understanding of what's going to be needed and how to forgive. That's always the very first play is to learn how to move things along and not try to grab on to what it's supposed to mean before they have become open enough to love's working the real meaning. So I always suggest that the ones who are just beginning go elsewhere and if you are just needing the next step, I'm going to help them much easier. I do pretty advanced work, as you can tell. I don't speak in an ordinary way. <laughs> and <laughs> the way I speak isn't just words, it's energy. So we're going to have a way to attune um, what is needed differently than before. I will not caretake. I have to give people just enough, and then they are to make decisions themselves. So I don't give you mantras or rituals but ways to pay attention and then come back and check in or listen for the study and then go back and do the practice. It's almost very Zen-like that way. That's the way that it happened in our Zen center too. Just to stay a witness of love and to use love and then to be in service. So if someone comes and is here at our center, we call it the heart gate, it's a residential um, way of having a completion of the way you behave wherever you are so that society becomes unique to you. It's not people. It's love society. It's, it's doting on what is so that we're basically contacting each other in a way we're not afraid to be real and always certain that we are here to support growth together. It sounds pretty natural and normal when any community comes together to work that way, but we're um, quietly changing the way the inferior mind, the old animal superstitious mind, learns to listen and behave. And it's mm -hmm. pretty powerful to watch, mm -hmm. but quite some doing to see too. Yeah, I get the sense when I'm listening to you that you're not just repeating things you've said a thousand times, you know, by rote, but you're kind of yeah. as you speak right. trying right. to bring into expression a very right. sort of subtle abstract level of, of awareness right. or, or intelligence and you're, you're trying to I, mean, I, I maybe the word trying right. isn't the right word but you're you're kind of uh, articulating on the fly uh, yeah. you know something that's coming to you intuitively at that moment and, and that's why exactly. I think the, the words sometimes come out kind of abstract when you're when you're trying to do that you're right. It's a totally different frequency when we're listening and then translating. Mm -hmm. It's not unlike channeling, but this is a little different body that I am now. So I am hindered only by the one I'm with in, in, in um, ways that can't be examined by 
the outlaws of our common thinking. They can only be examined in a state of neutrality and holy, strong, confirming what we call yes spirit energy, just affirming more than affirming, just being the whole body of awareness that doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. When that is happening, words start to change into more common sense words. It's a strange factory. It first makes the mind get all a buzzword. What is this? What is this? Until the mind softens and empties. And then the real energy actually starts to construct actual words that you can see sewn together that make common sense. Mm -hmm. So, so when you say hindered by the one you're with, are, are you kind of saying that um, mm. s uh, yeah. spontaneously and automatically um, mm. your b ability to express this is determined by the yeah. ambient yeah. level of consciousness of those who are to whom oh. you're expressing it? And, and if a person really doesn't get it, like you were saying before, you prefer not to work with beginners, then yeah. it's not going to flow yeah. from you. So clearly or profoundly as it will with a, a more advanced group. Mm -hmm. It'll tutor, but it will make it so that their mind is abuzz with wondering, what is this? Mm -hmm. you know, and hopefully they'll, they'll go study, what is this that is not as common to my thinking? The mind always has to be changed so that it can deliver itself to just a simple awake state without, with, without the gab in the way. So you have a center there. Are there. How many people are living in the center? Right now we have an, an interesting gathering. We have two who are here for a month or two residential student. And we have a family here. They have been students of mine for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. The children are 9 and 12. Mm -hmm. And obviously very well taken care of. So it's just delicious to have them around here. We have a very old, wonderful building that accommodates that. It's a very big building. In it's Portland, a, is it? We're in Hood, we're in Hood River. Hood, Hood River, okay. An hour from Portland, mm. right along the Columbia River. Beautiful oh. drive here. Mm. Yeah, a friend of mine used to go there windsurfing. Uh, yeah. And yeah. what sort of uh, transformations or unfoldings or awakenings do you see happening with the people who have associated with you? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I am so... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to things that I, I'm not sure I can put into words. I, I'm so impressed with a number of people who have finally noticed how to shift from polarizing to try to think about how to attend these words to just being open and aware and present and in every day learning how to to set down their old fits of how one does things and how my mother always did it or leave me alone so I can go and write and think by myself all of those things put away so that it's just communion mm -hmm. it's obvious it's obvious when you meet folks who've been around this work for a while it's just you li you'll like them <laughs> you'll like everyone sure you would, meet yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they're, they're not just up there saying, oh, we have such a loving place and we do such a divine thing together. It's, they're real people. Yeah, we, yeah. Just, we, we laugh a lot here. We howl with laughter. That's great. And uh, we get along enormously with whatever we're doing. <laughs> Having pizza, <laughs> going out and building a walkway, <laughs> whatever we're doing, meeting so the that, people. Whoever comes in is already remarkably just thought of as partnered. So there are no strangers. And I, I suppose that would be one of the most obvious parts about people who you'll meet who are doing this kind of work that we don't, we don't have, and none of us, a way to think of you as someone outside. This is not a problem that you're right here, and so you've always been here, and it's nice to meet another part of what is our natural state. Mm. Nice. <laughs> right. Sounds like people are very genuine, not, not yeah, a bunch of mood makers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, do people tend yeah. to backslide when they leave, or have you found that people pretty much whatever is maturation or development takes place is kind of stable once they leave? 
You mean leave from a, an from immersion your, or from, no from your place? I mean, let's say they stay because with usually, you. Because usually, usually the ones who are very intrigued and love this work will mm -hmm. come to the Telelinks. Mm -hmm. um, they'll come again several times a year for immersions. Mm -hmm. In in some way, they they stay connected. I, I have a, I have a mentorship offering where we talk together this way every every few months or sometimes every week, depending on the individual. Some people don't work with me for years and then they'll come again, do another retreat, and it's just that as uh, time goes along and they've done a, maybe a dozen of these, they'll say it's longer and longer and longer and longer staying power. Mm -hmm. they, they, they've learned to trust in it and use it, but that's the main thing. They, they come to do the immersion and then, then we all go and see to the practicum. It has to be a constant changing of the guard <laughs> to, to what is paying attention instead of defending against others. Mm. True. I mean, it has to sort of be integrated in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. earlier on when, I, when you spoke about this major shift that had happened or this major kind of milestone that had happened when you were about 39, you, you you didn't want to speak of it as any kind of with any sort of finality. It was more like a comma. You said you know. Um, so I presume there have continued to be commas and semicolons and so almost on. Almost daily. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing now. It's much more fun. I this is one of the common things I do tell people. You'll have a very lively, very wonderful life living this way. It's fascinating, and there's no opportunity to be bored, no opportunity to feel like I'd rather be dead. Even in crisis, even in chaos, you'll find that things change in you to help you know what to do with it. So what have some of the significant commas been yeah. in the last 20 years? Or if you, if you don't want to talk about those, how would you uh, describe the current situation as opposed to what it was two decades ago? Um, how, what sort of maturation or un clarification or unfoldment or whatever has there been and does there continue to be? Well, <laughs> maybe five years ago, I was grumpy with my partner mm -hmm. and nattering away, you know, with a, <coughs> you know, why doesn't he get it? <laughs> and the input basically said, and I'll give a, a simple rendering, there is no way for that which is to ever be bugged by anything that's not seemingly working well, huh. it's just, it's just available. It's just here. It's just, it's just present. You don't hit yourself to what is wrong, because the God side doesn't, doesn't bother with it. Hmm. And you know, Einstein said basically the same thing, and it's a very famous quote. You can't. I'm going to change it, flip it around to say you really can't answer something from the same level of the problem. Right. <laughs> that is a famous quote. And that is a big turnaround moment for any of us. Huh. It makes us laugh much more easily, mainly at ourselves, but also with others, and realize that the fantasy somebody is having is just a hindrance. Whatever's going on, the need is to believe in what is flowing in to support the delivery of harm in that man or woman and will just be part of the good flowing and part of the real current of awareness. Here I am as partner, not, not advocate for myself only, but partner to you in some manner. And I, and I trust that everyone is basically hindered and hinderable here and that there's very likely going to be a law in every person to take care of him or herself before they're going to wonder how to connect with the holy I am in themselves or in us and as well I'm partly willing to believe that part of awareness is to see what is, even all the way down to the dirt level. 
And so I'm not training people to be naive. I'm not training you in oversimplifying this. I'm not asking us to think, oh, that person is good, but that there is a way to support, to support the way, not unlike in martial art. You just find out what to do to keep the lines moving along until something can snap us to a better problem solution, a better solution of anything. So I, 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 my question was um, how, well, in simple terms, what has been the nature of your progress over the last 20 years, you know, your, your inner progress? And your, your answer, the first answer that came to your mind was, well, it sounded like to me you were saying, well, I've become a lot more patient with my partner. <laughs> whoever you are. Uh -huh. You whoever you are, whether I meet you driving crazily along the road causing a handicap for us. Right. And I also know now how alert we need to be to play the entire earth riddle too. So one of the things I did many years ago was touch into the earth current more. This is again hard to say because you'd have to believe me. <laughs> You really have to experience it inwardly yourself. But there is a way to touch in to the holy goodness of what is here and support it and in so doing open up the line of interface between this and the carnal appetites of earth that is seeking ways to work um, the evidence of its power in creation too. In simple words, I talked with the earth said that I would prefer not to kill any, anything under my wheels and said, how can I manage this? Can you put a notice out to the creatures who are near the road that I'm dangerous and <laughs> to stay away? Is there any way this can be done? And for a while, every time I went out, I would just touch in, set up that agreement, and say, let nothing harm itself because I am in its way. And it has so far uncannily worked. And I've been doing this, this particular method of it, sincerely, for about eight and a half years. Oh, nice. And it's amazing the difference. Hmm. So are, that's, you that's, are you a vegetarian? I mostly am. I'll eat <laughs> squiggly little slimy things that flow through our rivers and oceans. <laughs> <laughs> that includes eels. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I do it because I need a little bit of the earth frequency in me. And it's not that I think that animals have a more divine reason not to be eaten than plants mm -hmm. or even air, but that there are appetites we need to change so that we're not thinking that anything is for us that would in some way unnerve them but it is easier to take what is in agreement. You can actually figure out how to help plants be in agreement, fruits be in agreement, seeds be in agreement. If you're going to eat of the, the animal flesh, you can say, through me now, that which I consume, I will, I will vow to be a blessing, and not just in my human way, but I will take something of this one, and I will continue to inform the word of God that I believe uh, that whatever comes in must go back to source. Whatever I consume must be for some kind of source good. And it makes us more responsible in our attitudes again, in our way of confining anything to us, even a partner, <laughs> mm -hmm. even a cat, a friend, you know, box of goodies, something we're going to consume. We're starting to stoke it with the presence of goodness because we believe in it. Yeah, we believe doing, in it. Doing it to, for a higher purpose, not just to satisfy our, our appetite or something. In fact, the Native Americans used to say things like that. If they had to kill a, an animal to survive, they, they would sort of do a little blessing and consecrate it to a, the higher purpose of you know, needing to, to live, but they're not just doing it for the sport of it or something like that. And I used to think that was just a silly little myth. Mm -hmm. Then I realized that it 
literally stokes like a fire. It stokes, it kindles the way of one. It makes us more responsive and awake. It makes us need to clear away, again, redundancy and show up as who is willing to be a part of the play of energies. And on this plane, everything has to be kindled this way. It has to be lightened up or it just becomes a frenzy of who can kill what to stay alive and nothing actually works well here. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Well, do you feel that there's some uh, <laughs> significant area that you like to talk about to people that we haven't touched upon because I haven't thought to ask you the right questions or anything? I'm not sure I can say it enough. We are here to love, not here on Earth, but here as a package awareness of some kind. We are here to love in a way that uniquely makes what is work again uniquely not not ever the same way so our our need is to believe so strongly in this that we don't just look to be comforted by oh i know what to do here oh i know my my way of of talking to this man but before we do anything that we call love to be the counter point of evidence that we belong together and to undo whatever rat chase our mind has been in that brought us here until nothing remains but perhaps the cinder of the old thoughts and then even that can be moved into the one fire and changed. Mm, nice. Well, that was very poetic. I won't spoil it by trying to put it in my own words. <laughs> no, I, I, that's more the way I will speak. Yeah, mm. that's nice. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, I guess we should conclude. It's been a joy talking to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So let me just make some concluding remarks for the listeners. Um, I've been speaking with L. Collier Ray, uh, who lives in Hood River, Oregon, and uh, who, as you've been hearing during this interview, is a teacher and has people who come either physically or over the Internet to interact with her. So if you're called to do that, then uh, you'll find a link to her website on mine, badgap.com, and there's plenty of, there's her phone number and her email and everything else on uh, her website so you can get in touch. And um, this interview has been one in an ongoing series, which uh, if you'd like to be notified of new ones when they're posted, you can either subscribe on YouTube or you can sign up for an email newsletter at um, badgap.com and you won't get inundated with emails you'll just get one a week whenever I put up a new interview you get notified of it and there's also a podcast you, you can subscribe to if you're the kind of person who likes to listen to things while you're commuting or whatever um, so you see that there there's also a discussion group in which each time an interview is posted people start chiming in and discussing what was talked about during the interview so there will be one for Elle's interview and uh, sometimes the person I've interviewed comes in and responds to questions and issues that are that are raised so we'll do that if if you want <clears throat> so thanks for watching or listening thank you again l thank you and so much it's been enjoyable <clears throat> and we will see you all next time namaste namaste, namaste.